Golopian. Today we have Mikhail Saba, uh, who's uh, visiting us from Austin, and he's going to talk about enumerative geometry through sheets. Okay. Thank you, Vita. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm glad to be back after quite a bit. As I said yesterday, it's been eight years since I was last on the roof, so. Okay, so what is the plan? So in the next 60 minutes, what I'm gonna talk about, as is suggested by the title, is enumerative geometry through sheaves. Now, the basic goal of the 60 minutes is for them to be accessible for most of you, if not all of you. So please do interrupt me if you have questions, you know, or make comments if you like. So I'd like you to leave with something from this talk and then I'll say slightly more technical things towards the very, very end. But for, for the most part, I'll give you kind of a high level overview of the basic thought process that one could follow to approach problems in numerative geometry using these objects called sheaves, okay? Now, right off the bat, what is the goal? So I will start by kind of explaining what I mean by enumerative geometry. Then I'll, I'll say what I mean by sheaves and then I'll go to sheaf theoretic invariants for the third point. The goal is very vaguely phrased, okay? So it is to count geometric objects subject to given conditions. And as you can see, count is in quotation marks because it could mean several different things. It could mean obtain some kind of number. It would also mean obtain something better than a number, like a homology class or some other invariant, okay? And now why is this interesting? You know, intrinsically I think it should be interesting to the mathematician, but if you're not convinced, so, these questions, there were many enumerative questions that ranged almost 200 years ago now, right? And I'm not sure who to attribute them to first, but at least the Italian school, you know, 1850s, late 1800s, beginning 1900s, they asked a lot of questions of the sort. Let's give ourselves a cubic surface. How many lines are on that surface? And things like that, you know, how many conics in the plane pass through a certain number of, you know, points and so on and so forth. So they were interested in that. And what's not on that slide is that one of the reasons for the development of modern algebraic geometry, you know, like variety schemes and so on, I think has to do with those questions, how to answer them systematically in a way that's kind of uniform and gives us nice answers. Okay, not some kind of, the Italians were very good at doing concrete geometry, by the way, right? I mean, they were very good at that. So they could extract these numbers, but not in a systematic way. From a more modern point of view and what somehow sometimes I'm interested in, this counts, depending on the particular problem you're looking at, appear in theoretical physics, okay? So you could be counting some kind of strings, if you're doing string theory or brains, and this, you really wanna count some kind of geometric object, you know, some kind of curve, some kind of donut, some kind of sheaf we'll see later, and so on. And this is pretty recent, right? So string theory, there's all these counts happening the last, I don't know, 30, 35 years maybe. Okay. What's the idea? So the, mod, the modus operandi for us, so I'm gonna approach this from the point of view of an algebraic geometry, just to be clear. You could do enumerative geometry from different points of view, you know, number theory, symplectic geometry, you know, differential geometry, gauge theory. You could, you could frame it in, in many different contexts. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna approach it from the, from the point of view of algebraic geometry. And the idea is if you wanna count something, don't think about one thing that could happen, think about all things that could happen at the same time, right? So let's consider all possible configurations of the objects we wanna count at once. If we put all of them together, the hope is to construct what's called the moduli space. What is that? It's a space whose points correspond to the objects we're interested in understanding. For example, if you want to understand tori, or let's say complex structures on tori, or something like that, the isomorphism classes of those objects would correspond to points of our moduli space. And if you have some kind of map from a geometric object into M, that should kind of give you a family over that base B. So this is, this is supposed to be a family of tori. I didn't draw the hole in the middle, but you can imagine somehow the hole is permeating through, yeah? And here the tori all look the same, but again, I could be thinking about a complex structure on this, and the complex structure could be varying, okay? But as a shape, it's still the same, yeah? So if, you, if you're kind of fond of this idea, the next step is to say, okay, can we carry this out? And if so, what do we want out of this moduli space? So here's the basic three steps that people like to, to follow. So typically what you wanna do is construct this moduli space that's parameterizing these objects we wanna count. Part two is hope that this is nice. And nice could mean a lot of things, but the nicest thing you could hope for is that this is like a smooth and compact manifold, okay? So this M, this moduli space whose points are the objects we wanna kind of understand or count is smooth and compact. And once we're in that setting, 
we can just compute integrals. Okay, so we'll just pick some kind of cohomology class on this M and integrate it. Okay, the dimension for dimension have to match and so on, but you can extract some kind of invariant. Where does this gamma come from? Well, that's a choice you have to make. Typically, what you should think is the moduli space right now, it has objects. There is no constraint, right? I told you one account subject to a given constraint. The constraint is typically encoded in this gamma. So for example, if you wanted the conic to pass through a bunch of points, the points would be the data that gives you this gamma. So if you're kind of integrating against gamma, you're kind of forcing your conic or the points of this M to kind of meet gamma. Yeah, that's the basic idea. You could also do something else that looks, kind, that looks somewhat different, but it's not that different in the end. You could compute some kind of Euler characteristic if you want to get a number out of this. For example, topological Euler characteristic you could compute gives you a number. These two things are actually kind of the same. So if you, you know, in differential geometry, there is this, I always forget how it's called. Is it a Hopf index, Poincaré Hopf, Gauss Bonnet, some kind of one of these names. I think probably the one, Poincaré Hopf is the right one. You can get the Euler characteristic by integrating some cohomology class, which is like the Euler class of the tangent bundle. So these two things are kind of the same, but they, in what's gonna follow, they will be different. In any case, compute integrals, take an Euler characteristic, it gives you some kind of number. And that number, we should think of as the counting invariant. Best case scenario, even better, if you're smooth compact and zero dimensional, you're a bunch of points, then really what you wanna count is the number of points, okay? So this is the dream. Construct the moduli space, smooth compact, nice cohomology class, Simple enough where you can form, com perform computations, carry this out. So let me show you an example where this actually works, okay? So here's an example where everything is nice. So consider the following surface. So I'm gonna call it the Fermat cubic surface. Which is given by the following equation. So there's four variables and one equation, which is x0 cubed plus x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed is zero inside four-dimensional space. And for me, space or four-dimensional space will always be over the complex numbers. The reason being, if I want to solve some equations, I don't want to miss solutions for algebraic reasons, okay? So something's algebraically closed and characteristic zero does not have to worry about number theoretic problems, okay? So I'm gonna be working over C. You could try to do this over different fields, but for me, let's just stick with C for now, yeah? All right, and the question I wanna ask is how many two planes, so two-dimensional planes, so C2s, through the origin are contained in this surface? Okay. Now you might complain, how is this a surface? Okay, it's in four dimensional space. I'm cutting it out by one equation, so the dimension should be three, right? However, in algebraic geometry, if we want to compactify, and this is not compact also, right? You can go off to infinity in different directions. If I want to compactify, what's commonly done is we projectivize. So what we do is identify points which are lying on the same line. There is, that's the reason why this equation I'm taking to be homogeneous, right? Because I want it to be scale invariant in terms of the solution set. So to compactify this, what we're really thinking about is... He projectivize, not compactify, right? Compactify. To get something compact, he's not compactifying. I'm not compactifying in the sense that I'm adding something, yes. To make it compact. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So maybe I'll just write projectivize. But yeah, if you're right in what you're saying. So that means that I'm gonna identify x0, x1, x2, and x3 with whatever I can get by scaling that. We're gonna, it's not supposed to be the origin if it's not supposed to be lambda equals zero. Yes, I'm gonna write that. So for lambda in C minus zero and 
x here. Not the zero vector, yeah. So now, if you, if you think of that, what I'm doing, I'm, the, I'm identifying points up to scaling, I'm dropping the dimension by one and this is really a surface. So scaling drops dimension by one, the equation drops dimension by one, I'm in C4 minus zero, so maybe I'll add that here. Too. <laughs> yeah, it's two dimensions in complex world, four dimension as a real manifold, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And a two plane in this case, so the projectivization here, so C4 minus zero, if I identify by the scaling action, so this is, I'm gonna write this as C star, so C minus zero. This is called P3, three-dimensional projective space. Again, dimension is in the complex sense. And I'm gonna use the, maybe CP3. That's more common for some of you. So this leaves really, this equation gives you something in CP3. And if you think about these two planes, if I play the same game, identify things that differ by scaling, all I'm doing is I'm considering a line. That's called a projective line. So in the same scenario, these C2s, if I remove zero and scale, identify things, I'm getting what's called a CP1. So the question I'm really asking in this projective sense is how many projective lines lie in this projective surface? Everything over the complex numbers. That's really what I'm asking. Okay, what's the answer to this? Well, this is a famous problem. Actually, the problem I started from. When I, when I asked how many lines are contained in a cubic surface, that's an example of this problem. Cubic surface, lines, as in projective lines, how many are there? And you can do some heuristics. This is a pretty simple equation. So one thing you could do, what's a way to produce a line or a two-plane? Well, take this term, make it zero. Take that term, make it zero, right? I could do that. So one thing I could do, is pick two indices, let's pick the first two, and make this equation be zero, that will give me one line. And then take the other two indices and make those be zero. So you would get something like, I don't know, x zero is like a third root of negative one times x one. Maybe I should write in the complex. So e to the pi i over three times x1, let's say you pick that one for the first one, and then x2 is maybe the same, or I don't know, two pi i over three. Right? So, hmm? so you, you want it to be minus e minus. Yes. So I mean, for example, you know, one, one minus one would solve the equation. Yes, exactly. So, so you got, it's just saying you have to, you should add another. Pi over two. Yeah, but it's not two pi i over three. It's pi. Yeah, yeah, three. That's right. That's right. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I should have maybe left it cube root of minus one. Yeah. Okay. Minus, minus, minus a, a, a yeah, minus, minus one is a good example. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So that's one choice. But then, how many options do you have? If you play this game, for two choices, for a pair of indices, you have you know, four choose two, yep, no. So you have zero, one, zero, two, and zero, three. I want two pairs, of, so three options. And then for every one of these, I have three options for this, a cube root of minus one, three here. So three choices for my pairs of indices, three choices for this, three choices for that, three times three times three, the heuristic says 20, 27 this way. So heuristically, You expect something like 27 lines, right? All right, now let's approach this from the point of view of this, mod this, this strategy I outlined earlier. So here's the example. This is what we just did. Maybe there's a typo there, maybe there's not, but let me move forward. So the moduli space parameterizing these two planes inside C4 has a name. It's an example of what's called the Grassmannian. So the moduli space here, I'm going to write this G, so Grassmannian of two planes inside four space, and each point of the Grassmannian corresponds to a C2 inside C4. Now, how might you describe this? So this is something that everybody learns in linear algebra to some extent. 
I don't know how much success we have with that sometimes in classes. So you do Gaussian elimination, right? So to specify a two-plane, you pick some kind of basis, that's a choice, and then you row reduce a basis for C2. And up to me doing some kind of simplifications, the row reduce echelon form is gonna be something like 1, 0, 0, 1, and there's a bunch of four variables here that could be anything. So there's four parameters, A, B, C, and D, and my, my Grassmannian, at least around a C2, looks like this. So how many parameters? Four, there's no restrictions, nothing. It looks like C4, right? So it looks like four-dimensional over C. In particular, it's smooth, the way I'm describing, right? It's just literally C4. Again, local description, but you can cover this with all these charts. Okay, so this is great, this is smooth. That's, I'm telling you it exists, I'm telling you it's smooth, at least based on this kind of description. It's also compact, so from this description, it's not clear to see, but if you imagine limits of two planes, they stay two planes, that's the statement. So G is very good, it falls in this very nice, you know, framework. Smooth, compact, manifold. All right, good. Now, what are we gonna do to solve this problem? Well, I'm gonna use, so I'm gonna take these equations and do what we will do in kind of an undergraduate class, right? Just parameterize my plane, plug it into this equation, and force it to be identically zero. What's gonna happen? So if I've done this correctly, again, there is a high probability of typos. So x0 is gonna be a x2 plus b x3, x1 is gonna be c x2 plus d x3. I'm plugging into this Fermat cubic, let me not hide it, so we'll get a cubic in, four, in two variables, which is this thing. Doesn't matter what it is. There's four terms though, that, that's relevant. So there's an x2 cubed, there's an x2 squared x3, an x2 x3 squared, and an x3 cubed with some junk in front, yeah? Some coefficients, these are the coefficients. And you have a cubic in two variables, this gives you one equation per monomial four monomials, so four equations, in these four parameters. So if there is no redundancy in these equations, the expected number is finite, right? I'm cutting down four dimensions by four equations. And if you actually solve those, this is, this is set up to work this way. You'll find what I described earlier. So if you actually solve these, you can do it by hand, right? I mean, they're not so hard. You know, take C, solve for A, maybe plug it in, divide some stuff, it's not that bad. But you'll find exactly those. And you'll find 27. So this holds up. Again, this is again this is not 100% precise, but it's almost there. And it's only for this surface. So this is an answer to this problem I asked in the beginning. How many lines are in this, in this projective cubic surface? And this is true in more generality. So in reality, what's happening, if you want a more kind of high-tech interpretation of what, what we're doing, this 27 is the Euler class of a rank four vector bundle on this Grassmannian. And what's the rank four vector bundle? That's kind of interesting. So for every two plane, what I'm doing is I'm recording, if you like, the, the, the fiber of this bundle is cubics on that plane. And there's a four dimensional amount of cubics, right? Four coefficients per cubic. So it might help some people to so rank for complex vector bundle. Yes, complex vector bundle. Everything's over the complex okay. numbers. Complex yes, vector. absolutely. Everything is complex, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is the fourth Chern class, or you know, the Euler class if you integrate on this Grassmannian. And this happens to be 27 times the point. Now, this is all good. Now the, the real question is what if you're not in this dream scenario, right? So the Grassmannian is well behaved, nice, smooth, compact, no problem. But in reality, this will be the accident, not the norm. So in reality, what we'll have is you know, very non-compact or very singular M's. And even if you have something that's nice, there's no reason for these equations to be kind of transverse or to, to be cutting down the, the amount you want them to. There's no reason for anything to work like that. And in practice, it, will, it won't. What do you do? So there's a theory which is quite technical. So if M is not smooth, all we really, all we really need, if you think about it, to define this invariant is some kind of fundamental class to integrate on. Euler classes still make sense, so we can still work with them. So well, there's a substitute of the virtual of the fundamental class, I should say, which is called the virtual fundamental cycle or class, and that was defined around 1994 or 1995, independently by Litian and Bern and Fanteki. So this is something you can do in most moduli problems we encounter in practice. 
and it gives you a substitute for what you would think of being the, the fundamental class for a smooth money. Okay, so that's so solving kind of the fundamental class problem or the smoothness problem. Now, if M is not compact, this is a geometric question. You need to understand the limits of objects, right? So this is really, you, get to get to, you have to have to be concrete. So if M is not compact, you need to include some kind of degenerate objects and prove that these are enough to, to, to fill in limits that might not be there. For example, if you want to do Riemann surfaces or complex curves, like I'm drawing here, you could imagine that this develops some kind of node. Either by pinching, you know, if I go around the donut, I could pinch at some point, and that would create some kind of node, or I could imagine this, you know, joining it to itself at some point, right? I will develop a node, it's not smooth anymore. It's not a Riemann surface in the same sense. So, this is an example of the moduli space of, you know, stable curves. This is what would you do if you wanted to do Riemann surfaces, well, this is not compact. If you allow for these things, plus a little bit more care, you can fill in limits. And that works. So this is an example of how this compactification procedure could work. You would replace smooth curves by nodal curves that are stable. Question? They don't have the same as meridians. Uh, so this is a picture, yes, but there is, there is a way to account for that. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, I'm trying to, to kind of focus on the actual procedure rather than, yeah, but you're right. And then finally. Hmm? The cartoon is slightly misleading. Yes, yes, I agree. I should have, yeah, I guess decrease the, it should be not there. It's not, I mean, they don't, that doesn't happen, does it? That it comes around. It's more the pinching scenario, yeah, yeah. Because you look at metas that's the way you draw the picture, I mean, that's. Yeah. I mean, this is supposed to kind of do, you could interpret it both ways, yeah. And finally, for intersections, there is an algebraic way to perturb equations. So if you're doing differential geometry, you'd say, well, my intersections are not transverse. Let me move them about a little bit, and then they become transverse. In algebra, this is called deformation to the normal cone. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it does kind of the same thing for you. It's just a little bit more complicated. So the perturbation would look something like, you know, if you have ZW is 0, ZW minus 1 is 0, it introduces some kind of perturbation in differential geometry, there's an analog for that in algebra. So we do have a round, kind of roundabout solution to that too. So you, you didn't really put your, uh, your example in enough context maybe for people to follow that what would happen if you re replace this cubic equation with another cubic equation. Mm -hmm. And so the, the naive thing you could do is say you could count that these zeros are actually transverse. And that actually is a computation of, of, the, of the order class, but you could also use more sophisticated. Yes, absolutely. So let, let me actually say something more on that. So this is a good point. So one important property of these invariants or these integrals is that if you deform your problem, they stay invariant, which is which is a great point. So somehow, if this answer is 27 here that I'm showing you, if you deform this surface, let's say continuously or holomorphically, to some other surface, some other equation, let's say if I move my equation, but still say smooth, the answer is still 27. It might get even more complicated though, in the sense that the 27 in other examples of problems might not be an actual number. So here I'm producing 27 lines, and they're honest, but really this is a virtual number. So this, you know, this Chern class could not mean that I have 27 actual things. It could mean multiplicities, it could mean plus minus orientations. So it could get really complicated. And the compactness issue that you're worried about here is that if you were to uh, think of the moduli space as a moduli space of smooth things and you're in even something compact, and that's not intrinsically non-compact, and then you have to take limits. Yeah, you could acquire singularities in limits. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, excellent. So the basic principle here to sum all of these things up is that in some sense what we're doing is we're introducing some extra data to do all of these things. So we're thinking of our moduli space as cut out by a bunch of equations. That's an extrinsic presentation, so this is a choice. But right? it's dictated by the problem usually. So there's an ambient smooth space of certain dimension. We're cutting it down by some equations. The expected dimension is m minus r. And by perturbing, these equations should give you some kind of class in the expected dimension m minus r. Of course, Again, this is kind of a cartoon of what happens, but again, that's what you should expect. And locally, this extrinsic data, you could think of in terms of a vector bundle and a section. So this A is something ambient. 
Say that again? In homology, do we need to double? Uh, in homology, I do need to, uh, yeah, sorry. If you're doing things complex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so this is a typo, yeah. This should be twice, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yes, so this, this equations, you think of them as coming from some kind of bundle, and S is a section of the bundle. So what we're really doing, this virtual class will be the Euler class of that bundle. Again, typo here. And then it should be, you could also localize that the section if you really wanted to, but I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so that's kind of the basic general picture of how you'd go about producing this kind of counts we're interested in, in studying, okay? Cook up a moduli space, hope it's well behaved, apply this virtual machinery, you know, virtual fundamental class, integrate, produce some kind of number. That's the general kind of archetype. And now I want to move to sheaves. So let me pause and see if there are more questions before we go, move on. Continue. So now I'm going to try to kind of introduce the objects I'm going to be interested in counting, which are sheaves. So to do that, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of where these things came from originally in these counting theories. So it's a little bit of a dense slide, so I'll go slowly. So the, the particular problem I want to kind of consider is let X be a smooth, compact, complex manifold. It could be projective variety in algebraic geometry. And let's try to count curves, C, complex curves, inside X. There is two viewpoints that are kind of very common in algebraic enumerative geometry. One is you could think of, I always forget how, how this is called, the analytic perspective. This is the Cartesian perspective, and this is, I always forget how it's called. In any case, you could think of parameterizing your curve. What that would entail is you could consider maps from some kind of Riemann surface. It could have nodes, it could have different components, it could have markings if you want, holes, some genera, and so on. Maps from something like this, a Riemann surface, into your X. And that's essentially parameterizing a curve. This has a name, so the moduli space that comes out of this is called the Konchevich space of stable maps, and it goes by this notation, so m bar gn of x, and beta is, you should think of this homology class of this complex curve. So some discrete that. And if you follow this strategy, so this was done in the 90s a lot, and still people care about this in different instances, it gives you invariants that are counting these maps, that are called Grom of Witten invariants. So these are always first in string theory, hence the name Witten in here, and also Gromov considered this in symplectic topology initially. It was the 80s or 90s, I forget. But these are, these are heavily studied, these invariants in algebraic geometry. And this is kind of the maps perspective. Now the sheaf perspective in, in, this, in this picture would be to think of the, the curves not by parameterizing them, but by specifying defining equations. So on a chart, Let's say our, our manifold looks is Cn on a chart, and I'm doing algebra. So all I'm doing is specifying a bunch of polynomials that cut down this curve. So these are defining equations locally, f1, f2, up to fm, of my curve C. So the moduli space here has a name. It's called the Hilbert scheme of x, denoted typically by Hilbert beta n of x. Again, beta you should think of as the homology class of the curve. And n is, in some sense, markings or some other discrete datum I need. And the invariants that come out of this are Donaldson-Thomas invariants. And that's what I really want to focus on. So I want to focus on the right-hand side of this picture and actually generalize this. Okay, so this is curves. I want to talk about sheaves and not just ideals. Okay, so I need to tell you next what I mean by sheaf. Okay, but this is the picture. And actually, there's a, 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 a pair of papers in about 2005-2006 by Molik, Nekrasov, Okunkov, Parahari, Pande that shows to you, that shows that these invariants are equivalent to each other. So if you know the gram of Witten invariants as numbers, there's a kind of a formula that produces all the Donaldson-Thomas numbers out of these numbers and vice versa. So for this particular picture, these invariants produce the same information. Okay? But I want to focus on the, on the shift perspective and not on the maps perspective. Both are heavily studied, okay? There's intense activity in both. And I, I kind of think more about this most of the time. So what is a sheaf? So we already see an example here. So locally here, it could be an ideal in terms of the functions that, are, that live on our manifold. So if you have like a CN locally, it's just a bunch of equations that give you an ideal. More generally, I'll go back to the, to the slide afterwards. So what is a sheaf? So it, you should think of it as something that looks like a vector bundle, for example or an ideal or something in between. 
So what you should think of is I have my x here, and over every point, I specify some kind of vector space. But now the vector space could be jumping, right? So I could have something that's zero maybe here, a line here, a plane there, maybe a, I don't know, a three, three space there, and so on. But they're algebraically coherent. So these fibers, these vector spaces, vary coherently with respect to the complex structure of this x, or the algebraic structure, if you like. That's the picture. An example that you, you might be familiar with is a vector bundle. A vector bundle is an example, particular example of a sheaf, where the vector spaces have the same dimension everywhere. So it's like a three-dimensional vector space everywhere that's a rank three vector bundle. Again, complex vector bundle. And holomorphic. Hmm? Holomorphic. And holomorphic as well, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm doing kind of the most strict definition of everything, even algebraic in my mind, right? So, yeah. So just to be clear, is, yes. is this a tally of uh, coherent sheaf? Yes, that, 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 what I'm describing is a coherent sheaf, but I should say a few more adjectives to actually make it a coherent sheaf. It's not a tally of that sheaf. Yes. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, I, I misunderstood what you said. So I'm talking about the stalks here. So what I'm picturing is the stalks. Or I, not even the stalks. I'm actually doing fibers. Yeah. Supposedly germs and sections of those. Even less than that, I'm actually even doing fibers. You know, that's restricting to a point and thinking of the vector space. Yeah. It's like the underlying space that the Well, it has an associated sheet, is the point. A vector bundle, it does, a vector bundle yeah. does determine the sheet, but the determine is, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. I see what, what the complaint is. Okay, so I'm conflating. Yeah, I'm conflating the space of sections of a vector bundle with the actual vector bundle. Yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah, that's right. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm doing it on purpose, so I don't mind either. But, you know, if, if somebody minds, then I should answer. So. Yeah, some examples. So on C3, this is really a module over the polynomial ring C, X, Y, Z. And you could have it finally presented or finally generated as you, again. Put enough adjectives, it will become. So it could be an ideal or it could be direct sum. The ideal corresponds to what we saw earlier with this curve. A direct sum would correspond to a vector bundle, rank R. On any X, it's the same thing locally, but then you have to put them together. And that's, if you haven't seen this before, not quite. You know, there is some machinery to, you need to be careful slightly, but let's squint and pre pretend, you know, locally it's this, globally, we just put them together. Okay. All right. So let me do an example. Endpoints in C3. So I actually want to write something here. And I'm going to erase. I don't see an eraser though. Okay, it's here. Okay, so let's try to count n points in C3 by this machinery. So again, I'm going to be looking at ideals. I'm not going to be worrying about vector bundles or more general things. Okay, so n points in C3. So I want to show somehow what these things really behave like. So you could have, so if you have n distinct points, Unordered, this is something that shows up in many places and it was studied, its cohomology was studied by, Mac, was it McDonald? Or I forget who it was, 1960 or 1950. In any case, if the endpoints are distinct, this is really what you have in mind. The, 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 al the algebraic structure doesn't do much for you. But what could happen, and this is the picture I have there, is that you could have points where things come together or collide. And even worse, I could have, let's say, something that looks like this. So this is what's written on the slide. I could have something whose only kind of support is at 0, 0, 0, the origin, but it could still have some kind of multiplicity that gives me the right number of points. So for example, I could, I could write this as the ideal generated by x squared, y squared, and z squared inside c, x, y, z, right? And now the question is, how many points does that count for? How do you tell? This is the point of view of algebraic geometry. You look at functions. What functions survive once you kill x squared, y squared, z squared, right? So what survives? One survives. X, y, and z survive. The pairwise products, x, y, y, z, and z, x survive. And there's one more thing, if I'm not mistaken, which is x, y, z. Everything else will have something that's, that has a repeated variable. 
So this ideal gives you something that has amounts to eight points because there's only eight functions that survive. So this really gives you, so this is an element or a point maybe of M8 in my notation there. So Mn is a bunch of points which, which count to N. So this, this corresponds to eight points. And you could now see how complicated this can get. This is just, the support could be one point, and I could have you know, all sorts of things here that give me still 0, 0, 0, but don't look like this ideal, right? So I could produce this in different ways and still have an, a point in M8. Or I could have different points, let's say two points, and length four and four, or two, six, and so on, and this would come together. So this, even though the problem might look simple, once you allow collisions, this becomes actually quite singular as a moduli space. And you could ask, well, what is the, the number of points? How many you know, sheaves or like ideals that give you n points do you have? And that's already a non-trivial computation. So there's different ways to obtain this count. So there's this Berend Fanteki, Jun Lee, and uh, Berend, Brian, and Sendroy at different times in the decade 2000, 2010, who computed these numbers. And the way they compute them is they put them together, so Nn is the count that gives you how many points in Mn. They put them together in a partition function, and then they tell you that what you get is this. And this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the McMahon function that shows up in combinatorics or some variant of it. And this was obtained by different methods. And this is a relatively recent result, about 15 years ago. So this is already a hard problem. You know, This is kind of points in C3 or a threefold, if you want more generally. I should probably make it compact, yeah? All right, so a sheaf is some kind of vector bundle ideal looking thing, or if you want a CXYZ module, or see however many variables you have module locally. And then here's an example of what it could look like. Now for applications, one particular, particularly interesting setting is when X is what's called a Calabi-Yau Threefold. So again, threefold in the complex sense. So six real dimensions, three complex dimensions. So what is that? Simply connected, and then assuming it's compact, I wanted to have a holomorphic volume form that generates H30. If it's not compact, of course, you have more, more scalars to, to, to work with, but still. So simply connected to holomorphic volume form, that's Calabi-Yau dimension three. If that doesn't tell you much, a non-compact example is what we just saw, C3. And a compact example is an analog of this cubic surface, which I erased, but with the right number of variables. This is called the Quintic threefold. So it's how many? One equation in P4, four-dimensional projective space, that gives me threefold. So this is a famous example of Calabi threefold. And the Grom of Witten invariants on this threefold this was, I think, one of the third, you know, motivating questions, how to compute these invariants. And why this is interesting? Well, it comes up in geometry and physics a lot. So these calabi manifolds, you know, they're related, you know, if you're doing, let's say, dimension two, you get K3 surfaces. If you're doing dimension four, you can ask about hyperkeller things. Dimension three is actually particularly important for physics. So this is a compactification, this is used to compactify space-time. So this, these dimensions are kind of extra on top of you know, the Lorentzian kind of 3-1 space-time. Okay. So maybe, maybe it would help it to say that, you know, if you were, if you hadn't been using a qubit before, then you would not get some interesting finite number of lines. You know, either have infinitely many lines yes. or, or none at all, typically none at all. Where, so this is a case where you get a, a, a predicted finite number of lines. Of That's right. So I, I'm going to make that point later in passing, though. But this is absolutely right. So one important feature of this, if you're looking at it from the Donaldson-Thomas perspective also, and the gromov witten perspective, is that the fact that you have this holomorphic volume form, the expected dimension of whatever moduli space you form is zero. So in this description I gave you earlier with the ambient space dimension m and the, the number of equations r, m and r coincide in this particular. So this is important. So you do expect a finite number without introducing any gammas. You know, you just count points. Okay, so Richard Thomas, around 1998, so I'm going back in time now, 
was the first one to, to kind of use that observation as well to produce Donaldson Thomas invariants for Calabi L3 folds. And there is some kind of wording here, which I don't want to focus on completely. But all this says is that take M to be a modulized space of stable sheaves on a Calabi L3 fold X. I also need to put some conditions, fix the determinant, fix germ classes, and so on. Then Richard Thomas, what he did, he studied what's called the infinitesimal deformation abstraction theory of the sheaves in the Calabi L3 fold. And that really amounts to the, to the point that was just made. So what you do is you say, OK, I take a sheaf. I infinitesimally deform it, and I see what infinitesimal deformations there are. That amounts to something the tangent space of the moduli problem, or the moduli space M. And then if you want to extend, let's say, infinitesimal families, that's an abstraction problem. And the abstraction space and tangent space actually match. They're kind of dual to each other. So Richard Thomas used this to apply this Litian and Baron Fanteki machinery I told you before. And what this gave him is this virtual fundamental class which is in dimension zero, and now I don't have a typo because two times zero is zero. So, <laughs> which is good. And you just take the degree of that, or you just count the points. And that's your Donaldson Thomas invariant, or what I will refer to as the classical Donaldson Thomas invariant that was defined for the first time 25 years ago or so. And it's a topological invariant. Again, that was the point that was made earlier. If I deform my x, this really stays the same. So it only depends on the topological data. I specify the churn classes and so on. And this is, this is due to this description as a degree or an integral. OK, so that's the starting point of Donaldson Thomas theory. Now there's a plot twist. So if you're looking at this, this is really an integral, right? So I'm just integrating. Integration is a global operation, right? I, mean, I cannot just do cut and paste. I cannot just like take some charts from my moduli space, do some integrals, I mean, it all will give me zero probably. So I cannot do like local to global methods with these integrals. Yeah, there's a question, sorry. Uh, it, sorry, for, for Grandma Witten, it's a, a symplectic topological invariant. Donaldson Thomas is just topological or is it? So, so for Grandma Witten, I think you can, be, you can be more general than this, right? If you have an almost complex structure, it's deformation invariant up to keeping. So if you deform your almost complex structure, we're still compatible with the symplectic form, you should stay the same. Yeah. This requires a little bit more than that. So hmm. you said they were the same as the Grom Whitney invariants. Yes, they are, they are, yes. But it's like mirror symmetry or something? Yeah. Because there's a I shouldn't say mirror symmetry because these are this is the B side typically called in string theory, and the maps is the A side. But this is not exactly mirror symmetry. It's called S-duality or T-duality. So there's a different name. It's kind of confusing, actually. I was confused a lot about this, and I'm, I kind of still am. But I think it's a little bit more stringent framework. So, but of course, if you compare it with the gram with invariants, whenever these are defined, and then you just think of X as a symplectic, you know, almost complex manifold, and you deform, you're still having the same numbers, yeah. But from the symplectic viewpoint, I'm not sure if I can define this for you know, just a symplectic manifold with an almost complex structure. OK, but the, the allowed deformations aren't just? The allowed deformation here is I'm allowing, I'm deforming the complex structure of x. While remaining tamed by some symplectic form or just? There is no symplectic form in this, no. OK. Yeah. And, uh, the, the Donaldson Thomas equaling the Gromov width. I thought that was conjectural. Is it, is it known in general? It's proven for many cases in practice. So I think the, the state of the art is complete intersections and in products of projective, sp projective spaces. So that, that's like Pixton and Panhari Panda and a few more names I don't remember four or five years ago. It might be more than that, but it's true for that. But it's not known in all cases, no. Okay, okay so here's the plot twist. These invariants are actually motivic, and that was a big surprise. So whenever you're coming from this like intersection theory camp, and you're doing these integrals to compute invariants, if you see this, this is very alarming. Or not alarming, but surprising. You don't expect this to happen. So this is a major theorem in the field by Kai Baron, 2006, and it says the following. Essentially, it says that this degree of the virtual fundamental class that gives me the Donaldson Thomas invariant can be expressed as a topological Euler characteristic, except I have to use some function as a weight. So what this does is saying there is a constructible function on this M 
which by the way exists always. This exists for any M. But in this specific example we're studying, it just so happens that if you compute the Euler characteristic topologically of M, weighted by this function, so you know, this function stratifies your M, you compute the Euler characteristic of the strata and multiply by the value of the function on the strata, that's this weighted Euler characteristic, it recovers this degree. This is very, once you know it, it's not surprising, but before you know it, you don't expect this thing to happen. I want to stress that. Somehow, this is a global invariant defined by integration. It's really kind of cut and paste thing. And as an example, okay, this is a very reductive example, but suppose that your moduli space was just defined by the equation z to the n is zero. So it's really, it's really kind of a point with multiplicity. That's all it is. So in this picture, this M is something like some fuzz around zero where the fuzz is worth N, let's say. So that's supposed to be the complex plane seen from the side or something? That's supposed to be C, yeah, yes. <laughs> it's a complex line, yes, exactly. Yeah. So the Dawson-Thomas invariant, if you do this integration, and, and you trust me that if you perturb, you get numbers. If you perturb by an epsilon, z to the n is equal to epsilon has n root s solutions, the roots of unity times epsilon or something, or nth root of epsilon. So you get n roots. The Dawson-Thomas number is n. And for this Baron function, what it does, it tells you how singular your space is. So if you're smooth, it's plus minus one always. And that recovers, in some sense, this Poincare-Hopf theorem I alluded to earlier. But if you're singular, like this is, in this case, you compute it to be n. And of course, the Euler characteristic now is going to be n times the characteristic of the point, which is 1. So you get n again. So this is a very simple kind of example. Yeah, and this is a great theorem, really great theorem. OK, so now I want to move from classical Donaldson Thomas invariants in the last few minutes to generalized Donaldson Thomas invariants. So let me make a small pause, see their questions. Yes, please. If you go back to the previous slide, yes. you said that this, what you mean by this function v always exists? This makes sense for any, if I give you any project, let's say complex variety or complex manifold, you can always define this function. But the quality I have underneath is conditional on this m being, having a certain structure. So here I'm kind of, the m always exists and tells you how singular this new m tells you how singular m is. But the fact that this weighted characteristic recovers the degree of this cycle really relies on the fact that this M has certain properties. It comes from this moduli problem I described earlier. So could you explain the meaning of motivic in this context? Motivic just means that I can do cut and paste. If I split my M into an open part and a closed complement, I can just compute them separately and add them up. I can make this more precise that somehow this, I can lift this to the growth and degree of varieties. That's what I really mean by motivic, or you can hope to categorify and go higher. But I just mean that this is kind of the characteristic and you can, if you split into this joint union of like open and closed, it's compatible with that split. Okay. All right, so there's another, one more assumption I made so far, which I didn't tell you earlier which is that our moduli spaces behave like manifolds. That doesn't need to be the case, and in fact will not be the case very often. And why is that? It's because the objects we are trying to understand could have non-trivial automorphism groups or symmetries, right? So this, you could see this in a curve, let's say, if you have like genus one, a donut, there's a ton of symmetries that this has. If you have a genus two surface, a curve or hyperelliptic, then you have finitely many. If you have a sheaf, let's say, on the complex line, which is a CZ module, well, you could easily write down things that have a lot of automorphisms. For example, if I take a direct sum of CZ and CZ, rank to vector bundle, complex, then I can scale each factor, let's say, by C star. So I could scale the first factor or the second. I could have a GL2, so even more than that. And in general, if you really want to understand these integrals, you have to account for this to some extent. So if you remember earlier, I had something that was colored, but I didn't say anything about stability. 
And I'm not going to say what that means, but I'm going to say that we impose this for two reasons. One is to account for stabilizers. So if, if you actually impose stability here, these automorphism groups become trivial after you fix the determinant. They're finite, so they cannot be too big. That's one of the reasons we're imposing this here. But in general, you might not be able to do that. So the general scenario is that somehow, even if you think about stability or semi-stability, you might still not be able to eliminate these this symmetries. And it's important to, to, to take those down if you want to integrate, let's say. All right, so how do you solve this problem? So again, look at this fundamental identity. I have a degree of a cycle or a class equal to a topological Euler characteristic. Now, if M is not a space in that sense because of the presence of automorphisms, what is the issue? The, the left-hand side does not make sense. Why does it make sense? Because I need to be able to have degree of points. For example, if a point is a point, the degree is one. If a point, let's say, has a Z2 symmetry, the degree is one half, because I have to divide by the cardinality of the symmetry. But if my point has a C star symmetry, scaling symmetry, I have to divide by some kind of C star weight. And I need to specify that one, and consistently two. And that's hard to do. And it might be zero also, depending on the requirements you have. So the left-hand side is a problem because I don't have degrees of points, essentially. And there's more things that fail, but that's at least one thing, one of the things that fail. And two, the right-hand side, if you just naively apply it, does not give you what you want. For example, it's not deformation invariant. That's a problem. So it cannot be deformation invariant as, as property we like. All right, so around 2008, Konchevitz and Soibelman and Joy Song came along and they said, you know what, I can take this right-hand side and do some very complicated and refined combinatorial procedure to cook up a generalization of these expressions. So they actually write down weights and formulas that tell you how to generalize this. It's, it's an am amazing work. And it just allows you to define invariants in that regime. And again, it's a very complicated and very beautiful story, which I'm not going to go into, but there is a way to do it. And it looks like this, but you have to have sums, decompositions, weights, and so on. But there's still the question, okay, what if you wanted to do you know, an intersection theoretic approach? What if you wanted to do moduli space, virtual class, integrate, get a number? What do you do then? So this is what we did back in 2018. So this is a little bit of a technical statement, so I'm just gonna gloss over the technicality. So suppose that M is a moduli space parameterizing sheaves that could have automorphisms. So the right words to say, I have an Artin stack that's parameterizing semi-stable sheaves on a Calabria threefold X, and again, I'm specifying some chain classes, maybe fixing the determinant and so on. So you still only consider finite automorphism, finite group of No, this could be anything, infinite. So what, what I showed you earlier, this could show up. Then what do we do? So we can modify, so the first step of the theorem says we can perform some kind of surgery, and the word surgery here is in a very kind of loose sense. It's called a blow up in algebraic geometry, some kind of modified blow up to change this space, this stack M, and actually make it look like what we want it to look like. So eliminate these infinite automorphisms. And what we produce is a compact space in quotation marks, right words for the Lynn Manford stack, M tilde. So we can actually resolve this problem by doing a modification. What is extremely unclear is that, okay, let's say you did that. Can we still play this game of deformation subtractions that Richard Thomas played? Can we still do obstruction theory and deformation theory on this M tilde? Completely non obvious. Second part of the theorem, yes. The answer is yes. We can still do that. And then you get the same thing. The expected dimension stays the same. It's still zero. And the same machinery gives you a virtual fundamental class of M tilde, and you just count points on that. And that gives you an invariant. If you're in the previous situation where everything has finite automorphism groups, then this M tilde is just M. So all you do is you recover what Richard Thomas did. So M tilde is M, the machinery that Richard Thomas used, identical, the same, and the original fundamental class is what we had before. If you have automorphisms, resolve your M by doing some kind of complicated blow up Check that intersection theory works, and then you produce a class on M tilde. And that gives you access to a number. 
And we call this number the generalized Donaldson Thomas invariant via Kirwan blow ups because this blow up procedure is motivated by work of Kirwan around 35 years ago, 1985. Yes? Is this very specific to this geometric problem or is this sort of procedure? So this is an analogy with Behrens' theorem. So the first step you can perform for anything. So any art and stack you give me with some nice natural conditions, we can blow it up and eliminate automorphisms. We can always do that. But the second step is conditional on the fact that this comes from this moduli problem, much like Behrens' theorem. And can you sort of see it? These blow-ups geometrically? That, I, I, will end, I will end on that. On that question. So, yeah, just give me a few few minutes. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Now, further, there's more theorems we have proved. So, this is an ongoing research program which are trying to understand the generalized invariants. So, theorem of myself in 2020, you can do this for complexes of sheaves, not just sheaves on a Calabial three fold. So, it's a technical improvement, but the conceptual ideas are already, you know, all the, the ideas are, are really in here. So, you can improve this to complexes. There's a series of papers, 2019, 2020, and there's one more 2022 that's not related to this, but it's the same line of reasoning. You can do this in K-theory. By K-theory, I mean K-theory of coherent sheaves. In any case, there's a K-theoretic refinement which gives you what's called a virtual structure sheaf and not just a cycle. So this is really going into, let's produce more than numbers. And another theorem which is very recent, and I talked about yesterday in the algebraic geometry seminar, is that if you want to forget about where all this came from, what you're really doing is you're kind of doing resolutions in derived symplectic algebraic geometry. And I actually didn't say anything about the symplectic part yesterday. I only said something about resolutions. But all, the best way to think about this conceptually is that you're doing symplectic geometry and blowing up a symplectic manifold, but in a certain derived sense. So this kind of higher high analog the symplectic mean by resolution a model category? I mean resolution in the sense that I'm blowing it up. I'm blowing up M in that sense. So I'm resolving, I'm thinking resolution in terms of the automorphism groups. That's what I mean. I'm resolving the automorphism groups by making them smaller. But the resolution is in the sense of, you know, the use of the word blow up. All right, and some questions, one of which was already asked. So I already mentioned that, or I wrote it down, when I said stable, that's a choice. So it's, it's a choice of stability condition. And it's also related to this mirror symmetry perspective. It amounts to a choice, let's say, of Keller class or something like that. And if you change your stability, your numbers are going to change. Konchevich, Soibelman, and Joyce and Song tell you how your numbers are going to change. Now question, can we do the same? More interesting question for a geometer, and I think that's what you asked, this modification, is it a moduli space of something? So I blew up something that parameterized sheaves or complexes or something. Am I parameterizing something? It's really a million dollar question. Somehow, if you understand this, you should be able to answer everything else in some sense. And it's a hard question because people have been working with variants of this construction for quite a while. But I don't think anybody has a clear sense what you get. Third question. Can we promote Behrens' theorem to this generalized context? So Behrens' theorem related the classical Donaldson Thomas invariants by this classes, this integration technique and this motivic technique. Can we actually do this and relate the two? So these are equivalent problems, actually, the first and the third one. Part four, can we do computations? The answer is, unless we wall cross, it seems very hard. And one thing, Last two questions, what was so special about threefolds? So I told you threefolds are very important in string theory and they compactify space time and they're nice and so on. But why not Calabi-Yau fourfolds? So there is, there is ongoing work on this. So there's many people working on Calabi-Yau fourfolds. These invariants, class, the classical invariants, were will, will defined very recently, I think two or three years ago. No, five years ago by Borisov and Joyce and around two years ago by Owen Thomas. So there was an, a, dif a differential theory, an algebraic theory. We still don't have generalized invariants, but this is something we're working on. So it's a hard problem, but I think we'll have progress soon. And of course, what's special about three? What's special about four? There's gauge theory that you can do to convince yourself that singularities become very bad, so you should only think about three and four. Why not any n? I mean, you could do surfaces if you want, K3 surfaces, that still works. So two, three, four is fine. I don't know, about five folds. So I'll end there. So thank you very much.